thinking about a Wendell Berry quote, which says, you can't heal the land without the people, and you can't heal the people without the land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that that can really only be accomplished in very small scale with very small groups of people working together in guilds on bits of land where they're, that are their place. Um, and if I, and I have this vision that the world is um, fractal. The, what you see in the microcosm mm -hmm. is expressed in the macro mm -hmm. world. So if we, enough of us, start doing this micro work in small guilds of under a hundred people in the places where we're grounded, I think that it can only serve us as individuals and as individuals in a community and build, build that same level of community in other groups all you know, it spreads out from one group to your neighbors and then from those neighbors to the other neighbors. And I just feel like it has to happen in small groups doing the physical work together. Um, Wendell Berry's latest book is talking about the origins, of the, the way that labor has been devalued. Mm -hmm. and, um, and another article I read recently in The Nation is talking about how slavery... And by the way, Varda is my Dutch ancestor, was a white slave who arrived in, in uh, the early 1700s in New Jersey. And, um, and so um, slaves do work. Masters are thinkers and planners. Most of the honored professions for settler peoples are brain and butt work <laughs> instead of muscle and skill. And one of the most difficult problems we've been having with young people in spite of their interconnection and their is reskilling. They come to the permaculture courses and they go, oh, I want to know how to do that. Oh, I want to know how to do that. And I can tell you, over the last 12 years of teaching social forestry course, skill levels have been going down, not up. People coming to our courses want more and more head shrink shit instead of handwork and art uh, skill. This is another priority, is hand tools not machines. So one of my definitions of social forestry is take the machines out of the woods and put the people back in. And oh my gosh, I could go on and on about the horrid things that happened in the 80s and 90s in forestry and, and how that is changing. But I want to go way further. You know, I want, when you work with hand tools in a convivial way. You don't disturb nature. And one of the one of my favorite examples of, of emergent properties of complexity is that when humans singing, laughing, and working together, making messes, are happy doing this work all the wildlife comes right up to you. It just comes, what's happening? What's going on? What's, is there a party here? I mean, it's fabulous. And I mean, it's even, even in downtown East Bay, I, I, it, all my life I always am cheered up because every time I spout some utter bullshit, some kind of wildlife starts laughing at me. <laughs> And it's so obvious. I mean, it's so obvious. I go, yeah, yeah, I know. Okay, whatever. Uh, but, or, or to be more specific, 
you're doing some disturbance, you're cutting some branches down, you're doing a little light burning, what's the first thing that happens? These multiple flocks of small birds come around. And these multiple, these, these uh, guilds of birds are working different layers of the ecosystem. And they're like moving like a spiral storm through your work area. Like when my kills are going early at 5 a.m. in the morning and there's smoke moving up into the trees, boom, one of these flocks comes through. And, and, I, and I know, oh, I'm, I'm causing there to be some bugs to fall out of the white oak trees. I'm, you know, I'm being checked out. But I'm also being encouraged. I'm being joined. I'm feeling like I belong. I'm feeling useful as a human. And I'm getting some feedback that I should pay attention to. And it would help if I had been raised a child and I knew every one of these birds and I knew all the stories for every one of these birds and I don't even need to look because I know their calls and I know how they move. And, and so the whole thing just triggers memories. Every, every language, every indigenous language of people who are still connected to place that I have ever studied does not consist of words. It consists of phrases. Plain speech, Quaker talk, is a series of phrases, not words. And every one of those phrases refers to a story. So when you have a conversation in phrases, you are connecting everybody's memory. I, when I teach permaculture now, <clears throat> with attitude, um, <laughs> and I use the posters that are in this book at full size. And I have the posters all the way around the classroom like a fishbowl. And I'm able with a rod of willow or a laser pointer um, to see this. It's connected to that. And it means this. And people's minds open up. Because it's three-dimensional symbolic thinking. We do not think in words. We do not dream in words. We do not do art in words except performance, like I'm doing this evening. Okay. Very important. So I highly recommend Paul Shepard on Nature and Madness. Mm. The child needs to be out in the woods, completely wild, stung, scratched, fallen, broken, rolled, stripped, angry, sad, happy, the whole works, in order to have a full symbolic repertoire in their memory banks. And most of us do not have a full deck of cards. How are we going to think if we don't have a full deck of cards? And you get that, says Paul Shepard, uh, without language, through direct experience in nature as a child. And then you can think. But culture, proper culture of place, is going to work that out. So I think all of these drainage basin spokes councils, what I'm calling watershed councils or drainage basin councils, with their delegates and the fishbowl operation and the elders overseeing, should be in cathedrals of symbols. And that's the druidic alphabet of the trees. It's the Greek pantheon. It's the medieval cathedral. These are all places of mnemonic architecture where people go to learn storytelling and memorization.
and memorization is way better than knowing how to look everything up on your iPhone. It has to be connected. We're in, it's a transition we're in. This, this computer thing is incredibly brittle. All we need is a, is a class five solar flare. Boom, it's, true. it's over. <laughs> Scotty. Be ready. Be ready. Have other tricks in your bag. Start working on those tricks. Put that toolkit together. Get your hand toolkit together. Learn what forestry tools actually work. Relearn how to use a broad knife. Learn to use Japanese saws. Every time I have I, I have people come to my courses and to my internships and I ask them to be some personal tools and then I ask them to use them and none of them are using the tools properly. None of them. And I can hear it. I don't even have to look. <laughs> I can go, no, no, no. So then I have to show them how to use it and how to sharpen it and how, so this and then how to make them, right? So this is kind of exciting, isn't it? I mean, this is like work we can do that's like really cool. Um, so, do you know how much longer I could go on? I mean, <laughs> are you kidding me? I, I had one of, one of my students got, got to look at an advanced copy of the book and he said, you wrote it all down. I went, no, I didn't. No, not even close. Not true. So I hope you enjoy what I did write down. And, and I hope I was able to give you a little context this evening. And I want you all to notice your dreams. And, and, and start to do this work. Some of it is reading. Um, uh, Peter Bain, in his uh, comment on my book, said, the bibliography alone is worth the price of admission. <laughs> so I did my work. I've had my life. I hope I get a little further. I would like to teach my grandchildren some skills. I'm very happy to have lived a long time in Southern Oregon and to feel like we've got some traction. And the Applegate Valley is um, ahead in many ways. And what is happening now with a couple of my um, uh, colleagues, uh, Miku and Megan, is um, resilience hubs in rural areas. And I'm afraid it is actually starting to happen that there's going to be a reverse migration from the cities back out to the country. And there's a tremendous amount of degraded agricultural brownfields that need to be re-inhabited in order to increase edge and biodiversity and carbon capture. And climate change <coughs> is a, what do they call them, a bugger bear, uh, a tar baby, uh, a distraction. Really, folks, climate change has always been going on. And all of modernity since the early 1800s has developed in what's called a climatic optimum. For modern civilization to be pissy about change is very <coughs> short-sighted. It's really missing the point here. If there is a really bigger point that's difficult here, it's petroleum-based products. We are addicted to petroleum, and we are not understanding microplastics and nanoplastics. It's a way bigger problem than climate change. It's called physiological congestion or biological congestion. And uh, I 
love to knit, but I can't afford wool. Oh. It's too expensive. And it's really being hard on me because I'm trying to get plastics out of my life. But again, we become a people of place. We can live more, see, more simply <laughs> and, we can, and we can get there. And I believe we will be happier people once we get simplicity in place. My ancestors say so. Thank you, my mom, for telling me all these stories and keeping the thread, <coughs> keeping the continuity. And then I did, in fact, find books about Elias Hicks through a Quaker bookstore in San Francisco called Inner Lights Books instead of City Lights Books. Uh -huh. And Paul Buckley. And if you want your mind blown, you could read the essential Elias Hicks, and you'll you'll see. I was everything my mother said was re, was confirmed by the research that Paul Buckley did for the earliest Hicks sites. So <coughs> that continuity was very healing for me. It was really it was really good. And the Quakers are the people, the white people, on the North American continent that still hold treaties. We have what are called mutual aid treaties. And when, when you read in my book, The Ten Steps to Becoming People of Place, the last thing you do is establish mutual aid treaties with remnant First Nations. And you got a lot of work to do before you get there. Um, reading the treaties that were never um, confirmed by the Senate, um, trying to find out as much as you can about what happened where you are, and being real about it. It's a lot of work, but it's joyous work. It's, it's wonderful. It's like discovering treasures. It's like a treasure hunt. So I wish you all a good placeness. <laughs> And I'm kind of worn out. <laughs> I'm just thinking of that Quaker hymn, but I can't remember all the words. Is a gift to be simple? Is yeah. a gift to, to be, be kind? Free. 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 To be free. To come down in the place you want to be. Not, not a Quaker hymn. Oh, okay. <laughs> what was shakers. That? Oh, shakers. Right. Okay. And by the way, um, Quaker is a slur. It's a journalism slur. A, a, we call ourselves the Religious Society of the Friends of Jesus. And we refer to him as Rabbi Jesus. And, um, and uh, where was I going with that? Oh. Slurs. All right, yeah. So there was a Quaker in an English magistrate in, in, in court, and he wouldn't take his hat off. It's a thing. And, uh, and, and, the, and the judge was like yelling at him. And the Quaker said, I do not quake before thee, only before the spirit. And some damn journalist wrote it down. Quakers, all right, they're Quakers. <laughs> we went, all right, whatever. So you see Quaker oats shot from gun, Quaker motor oil, Quaker whiskey. We don't have a patent on Quaker. We actually invented the Monopoly game to try to get our kids to understand what the hell was going on. It got stolen from us by Parker Brothers. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the Quakers made a whole bunch of mistakes. We invented penitentiaries, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, canals, modern... Oh, wait a minute. That's the other branch of Quakers. <laughs> the Nixon-Hoover branch of Quakers. The Evangelicals. Okay, that's getting into the weeds a little there. But it, it, there's really a sense of people. So there is, I, I like this conversation about fractal, right? There is a global coming together, and its storytelling is indeed the fabric of that, that, meaning the weaving of that. And 
Thus I love those stories and the fairy tales that tell, to teach us as no botany and stuff like that. But at the same time, the Dunbar's number and the nature of place means we really do need to understand things on a local level. Interestingly, this whole California coast is the most diverse native linguistic map of the whole North American continent. And basically, crazy split-off groups have been coming to the California coast for thousands of years. You think you just got here? This has been going on a long time. And it's this geology of mm, pasted terrans and captured archipelagos has created the Franciscan mud with the marshmallows in it, like Mount Tamalpais. And... Um, and so this has allowed this really fractal ethno-botanical, ethno-cultural complexity. And now we have it. People from all over the world. Oh my God, the Bay Area is so interesting now. Oh yeah. I mean, I walk down San Pablo Ave and it's, yeah, okay, I can quit. Oh, I can sign some books. That's a great idea. <laughs> I'm starting to babble. I've been at this. I've been away from home for a while. Karen, do you have a suggestion as to the architecture of the our transitioning of where Hazel might want to sit and sign? and? Oh, uh, I and have or... this wonderful chair to sit in. And we could even put the chair on the other side of the table. Oh, that might work. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and I encourage people to start talking to me, and they can ask me questions while I sign, I guess. But don't I, let me go off. No. And, <laughs> and, and will you join us for some biochar making, Hazel? <laughs> I'm pretty tired. <laughs> I would like to see your setup. Okay. You know. Okay. And uh, and I'm. I have. I think I've invented a new type of biochar, which is oxygen quenching instead of water quenching, because oh. I live in a desert. Well, at so. the very least, you must come and explain to us oxygen quenching of char. In our Japanese cone kiln that Bear and I made at All Power Labs in Berkeley. Oh, I got to see that. Yeah. Okay, but give me... Give me something else to do for a little while. Sign books. Oh, good. They came in.